How to make an unbreakable hull. Hello, everybody. I am Nick the Naval Architect. You know, ship structures, they suffer as the unsung hero on ships. We see the hull as just this static container. There are no dials on the bridge. There are no warning lights, nothing that looks flashy. The ship structure doesn't get the same attention as the engine or as the other mechanical equipment on the ship. But all of that changes with an icebreaker. With icebreakers, your hull has become the primary tool. That steel is the reason that you're here. The massive wedge at the bow that we use to crack open mountains. And all of this, despite the fact that it's a hollow tin can with an average density that's lighter than the very ice it's cracking through. It doesn't seem like it should work, does it? So the question is, how to build an unbreakable hull. <laughs> Before you think I know everything, a quick disclaimer. This is general information only. Ice breaking is very much a specialty within the field of ship design. Now, I have done some work on ice class vessels and worked with a polar class cruise ship, but there are still plenty of people out there who have far more detailed knowledge than I do. If you end up working with one of them, listen to those specialists. The first trick to building an unbreakable hull. It's not actually unbreakable. The strength of the hull is actually tailored to the strength of the ice that we're going to be cracking through. You see, not all icebreakers are equal. We actually rank the ships based upon their ice class, which roughly relates to the thickness and strength of the ice that they're going through. A higher class matches to stronger structure and bigger ships. Admittedly, this gets a little confusing since there are multiple companies out there that have different rating systems. The figure on your screen shows one of the more common systems, the Polar Ice Class. We start all the way at the top with the strongest being Ice Class PC-1. And down at the bottom we have PC-6 which matches to the summer months. A vessel with Polar Class 6 is normally going to avoid the solid ice pack. It's not trying to find fields of ice, and it's only going to occasionally break through some light spots of small icebergs. But all the way at the high end, there are only a few vessels right now that have Polar Class PC-2, as of the year 2022. The cruise ship Le Commandant Chacro was built to take passengers to the North Pole, cracking its way through ice that is 2.5 meters thick. 2.5 meters, that's 8 feet thick. I mean, just think about that. That is a wall of solid ice that is as tall from the floor to the ceiling, and the ship is just going to push straight through that. You notice how I said the biggest was PC-2? Out of the 93 major icebreakers that are in service at 2017, there are no PC-1 vessels. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the challenge behind an icebreaker structure. We've already cataloged situations that are harder than what we have currently built. Ice is a tough nut to crack. Instinctively, you might think, right, Time to build the unbreakable hull. Super thick plating all over the place. Make it as hard as a tank. Well, we can't really build the ship from solid steel. Remember, this is a floating structure. It has to remain light enough to float. And that requires us to think very strategically about where we're going to need reinforcement for ice. I mean, clearly, we don't need to put it up on the superstructure. That never even touches the ice pack. Funny enough, you also don't need to put it at the very bottom of the hull. Most icebreakers have a deep enough draft that the bottom of the hull actually extends below the regular ice thickness. But we do need to put reinforcement above the waterline. There are large sections that are going to carry the stress above the normal ice thickness. What we get is something called an ice belt. 
It's a very narrow region near the waterline, and that takes the bulk of the abuse from ice breaking. We focus most of our reinforcement there. And then we fan outwards, going above and below the ice belt with reducing requirements for reinforcement. Well, how much reinforcement and how far do we go out from the ice belt? That's determined by the ice class. I've got to tell you, structural engineers hate complicated diagrams like this because it means a lot, a lot of calculations. We have to do checks for every single region on that boat. We would much prefer this just to be a simple, easy rectangle that covers 90% of the hull, one set of calculations, and we're done. Not possible with icebreakers. And that tells you a lot about the burden of the ice belt, that these diagrams include so much detail. Look at the regions of this ice belt in more detail. We start by defining a lower ice water line and an upper white ice water line. That's the section that's going to take the biggest pounding. But notice how that region starts to get larger as we get towards the bow. The reason we're showing so much scrutiny is because this ice belt is heavy. It's full of reinforced steel. And so we need to do everything we can to minimize the sections of the ice belt. At the same time, recognizing where it gets larger and where we need to put that heavy steel. And you get this really complicated diagram like on your screen. Every different hatching on that diagram is going to be a region with different reinforcement requirements. And we have to consider how to transition between those regions as well. So creating an unbreakable structure that still floats, it's really a matter of very carefully understanding exactly where you need the unbreakable hull and no further. Like I said, the main focus here is minimizing the weight of the steel. And I want to really explain to you just how much weight goes into this reinforcement. Let's take the example of the Mackinac, uh, Coast Guard number WAGB 83. This was a 1936 icebreaker that saw service local to the Great Lakes. This is not even a polar class icebreaker, but it still had an ice belt with hull plating that is 35 millimeters thick. Have you ever tried to pick up steel plate that is 35 millimeters thick? I promise it won't work. A single square meter of this plate weighs 265 kilograms. That's 605 pounds. You are going to need a crane just to pick up a small section of plating. And at a rough guess, the Mackinac had 352 square meters of plate. If we add it all up, we're talking 97 metric tons of weight just for the hull plating. I'm not even talking about the internal reinforcements, the stiffeners. This is just the skin of the hull. I mean, 97 tons. Good Lord, I know whole ships that weigh less than the ice belt on that. And so on the one side, you've got the structural engineer asking to put more reinforcements in and trying to make this an unbreakable hull. And then on the other side, you have the naval architect trying desperately to keep the thing afloat, saying, please make the structure as light as possible. It's a careful balance between strength and weight. This is something we do on every ship, but on icebreakers, that gets ratcheted up to a whole new magnitude of difficulty. To achieve that balance, we have to really put in the extra effort and scrutinize every little tiny detail. Speaking of dropping the weight, my kittens, they're wasting away. Or at least that's what they think. Without subscribers, they, they can't eat their kibble. It'll run out. Uh, again, that's what they think. And just look at those numbers. Only 15%, 15% of the viewers are subscribed to this channel. The kittens, they ask why, 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 why? Do you want them to starve? So please subscribe to the channel. Do it for the kittens, they're cute. Hard to do that and keep a straight face. I've talked about structural reinforcement and how the goal in icebreakers is to use every trick possible 
to reduce your reinforcement requirements. And we really use all of the tricks possible in the bow. We really scrutinize this to the point where the shape of the bow actually controls the reinforcements that we need there. This is something you never see on any other ship. Any other ship in the world, we just design the hull to handle a certain pressure, and that pressure is not really controlled by the shape of the hull. We just more or less pick a conservative number and assume that, regardless of what the shape of the hull is. But with icebreakers, we have shaped that bow like a giant ramp intended to ride up on top of the ice and crash down from above. This creates titanic forces. We're not talking about distributed pressures from water now. We're intentionally impacting against the ice. We're intentionally creating high pressures in small localized regions. Surviving that impact is going to require more than just strong steel. We actually borrow from the idea of tanks. You see, tanks will angle their armor to deflect incoming shells. We do the same thing with an icebreaker. We carefully shape the angles of the hull at the bow plating, and those angles actually feed into our equations to determine what level of reinforcement that we need. We are trying to create a bow shape that still acts like that wedge, but at the same time, we're controlling those angles to carefully pick the point of impact and make sure that the ice gets deflected away rather than hitting the hull head on. We want that raking impact along the plating instead of hitting it squarely. And we're so obsessed with this that we actually consider both the horizontal and the vertical angles of the shell plate in combination. The equations, they even change depending on the orientation of the supporting stiffeners. If we have vertical or horizontal stiffeners, that actually affects the level of reinforcement we need. So we really are designing this bow to deflect bullets, or in this case, chunks of ice. Now, given the need for these super strong structures that are light as a feather, you might think that we're going to immediately go to the highest strength steel out there that we can find. There are multiple different grades of steel with different strengths associated. And you can get some really strong steel. But no, 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 no. We're not doing that. You see, higher strength steel comes with trade-offs. The higher the strength is on your steel, it tends to become more brittle, easier to fracture under a sharp impact. Like, say, the impact of ramming the ice. So instead, we want ductile, flexible steel. If the worst happens, we want our steel to bend instead of cracking open, because a crack in steel means water is flooding in. Brittle steel spells doom for ice breaking. Here is where the ocean gives us a double whammy. We're already contending with all the pressures and structural challenges of cracking through mountains of ice. But ice forms in cold water, and the temperature matters. You see, in cold water, a normally ductile steel, something that would normally bend, it becomes brittle. They have a transition temperature. Get your steel cold enough, and it stops behaving like a ductile material. It acts brittle and shatters. If you've ever seen videos of people dipping things in liquid nitrogen and then letting them shatter into little pieces like glasses, that is your ductile to brittle transition. Every material out there has their own transition temperature. And unfortunately, the transition temperature for steel, that hovers right around the same point as the cold polar temperatures that we find. Your normal mild steel, it's going to transition to brittle at somewhere around minus 15 Celsius. So we are in the region of this transition temperature. So we can't just pick strongest steel. We have to go beyond simple strength to also consider the impact energy of the steel. That's how we measure its ability to resist brittle fracture, something called impact energy. And we have to measure it at cold temperatures. Somewhere out there is a lab where they've taken little samples of steel, stuck them in a very cold refrigerator overnight, and they're hitting it with a calibrated hammer to test its impact energy. 
simplifying the result of that test, basic answer is more impact energy, a bigger number, that is better behavior at lower temperatures. And this is a real kick in the teeth because despite our need for high strength steel, the impact energy may actually be the more important number. That might be what governs our selection for our steel properties. Quite often, we're selecting very, very weak steels just because they have very good impact energy. Because we have to think about how this steel is going to behave impacting against that ice again and again so that it can survive decades of abuse. I know, it's not fair, is it? <laughs> All the things are stacked against you when you're creating the structure for an icebreaker. But that's kind of the fun part of the challenge. And this is why icebreaker structural design is pro-level engineering. You see, someone once told me that icebreaking, it felt like crashing your car straight into a brick wall and then repeating that process again and again and again every minute of the day. Can you imagine a car that could do that every minute of the day and walk away perfectly fine? <laughs> I mean, the challenge for that. But that's what an icebreaker does because the structure on that icebreaker is very highly optimized just to make sure that it will still float. It's very strongly reinforced where we need it. And we're even going to the point of shaping the hull shape itself from a structural perspective to avoid concentrating all of these forces. Remember, we want that raking ice damage rather than a solid blunt on impact. It's a serious challenge. You have to bring your A game when you're designing an icebreaker. And you really have to focus on all the small pieces. Small details that we would normally gloss over for a standard ship. Because we really have to balance the high strength requirement against the low weight requirement. And when you get that balance just right, oh, it is so sweet. We form a hull that is so strong that it can crash straight through a brick wall and keep on going. Just awesome. Thank you very much. I am Nick the Naval Architect. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. Say, do you wonder where all the knowledge for these videos comes from? That's actually my primary job, working as a marine consultant at DMS. At DMS, we are data-driven, digging into the regulations, looking at all the idiosyncrasies, and uncovering the reasoning behind the common sense. Check out the website, give us a call, and let's discover how we can make your ship exceptional. Thanks very much.